put it in his diary, his experience of the day, which is just as relevant today as it was then. Some felt God's presence. I felt his presence. The great noble soul pervading everything, which will dwell on and on after we are all dead. St. Peter's here in Bournemouth is now preparing for the celebrations to mark Paris' birth in their own way in June. In Songs of Praise next week, Diane Louise Jordan visits Scotland's Cairngorm Mountains as she joins hill walkers and local people in Aviemore. But from all of us here on this special anniversary, good night and God bless. And next Sunday's Songs of Praise is here on BBC One at the slightly earlier time of five to six. Wanted. And I think the moment that the divorce came through, which as I recall was uh, in August, uh, was probably the saddest moment of her life. And I remember saying to her at the time that it, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning. <laughs> The last few months I was dressing her, there was certainly this new confidence coming through her. Probably my favourite dress that I made for the princess was the little blue one that she wore at the National Ballet. Um, it kind of said everything about the princess at that time. She was feeling great, she had this great tan, she'd just come back from a holiday. She was looking fantastic, had a very short skirt which showed those great legs. You know, just even the way that she walked, she wasn't holding her head down anymore. She was walking upright, and there was just this newly found confidence in her. There was a great difference from the princess I first dressed and the princess as we knew her um, recently, obviously up to the, up to the crash. Um, the, the new princess was far more confident, really sure of herself, and really quite carefree. I think that her life went through her broken marriage into a fairly deep trough. And at the bottom of the trough, she hardly realised what she was writing, what she was saying, what she was telling people. But the happy thing to remember is that towards the end of her life and at the end of her life, she was coming out of that trough and rising again. And I think, certainly I like to dwell on that time, because she was a different person at the end of her life from what she had been two or three years earlier. Happier, more relaxed, more self-confident, clear in her head what she wanted to do, and doing it very well indeed. In January 1997, I flew to Angola in southwest Africa. This was a working visit. I wanted to support the Red Cross by highlighting its campaign to ban anti-personnel landmines. First of all, that she needed to learn a lot about landmines. And she travelled as a Red Cross volunteer, not as the patron of the campaign, not as a member of the royal family, but as a British Red Cross person, travelling with me. When you travel abroad, you never manage to get to these places. Actually, I feel more comfortable doing this end of the market yeah. than the other end. <laughs> she even travelled in our vehicles. She, um, she dressed like a delegate. Uh, she didn't uh, uh, want to be treated in any other way than uh, as though she were working for the British Red Cross. Otherwise, she would never have got to see as much as she did. On my way from the airport, I began to see the effects of 30 years of conflict on this country. I'd read the statistics that Angola has the highest percentage of amputees anywhere in the world, that one person in every 330 has lost a limb, most of them through landmine explosions. 
but that hadn't prepared me for the reality. I've never seen scenes like it before. I've never been in this environment, but uh, it's very humbling. For us, this was also about, and for her, about raising the profile of the landmines campaign. So we couldn't shy away from the fact that we had about 80 journalists travelling with us, and I don't know how many TV crews, uh, plus a documentary team. Onwards, onwards, which way? <laughs> we follow. <laughs> The next patient I met was Sandra de Chica. Can you, will you ask her where the mine was? The famous shots of the princess with Sandra were not, in a sense, pre-planned. She happened to be in the center that day, having her limb fitted, uh, and the princess saw the limb being fitted. How, how long has she been waiting for a prosthesis? She's waiting for the prosthesis for about three years. They got on extremely well, and Sandra was very happy to have her photograph taken outside with the princess. And uh, I think Sandra is still staggered when we told her earlier this year that um, her photograph had been shown all over the world. I don't think she really believed it. I think the princess was well aware of what her job was. She was a real professional, and her job was to raise the profile, but also to learn quite a lot for herself. We were all nervous um, because uh, the things do go wrong on minefields. So we actually had to go into the mined area, pull her out. Unfortunately, by the time we got to the hospital, she was dead. She was that fine. What you saw was a, tr a track that had been cleared with live mines both sides. Oh, we were right in the middle of a minefield, no question. What we're going to do now is place a charge here and um, you will detonate the mine. You know, just press a button and it'll be a bang and you'll have got rid of one of these things. Firing. Thank you. I'll never forget the number of journalists who spoke to me at the beginning of the landmines campaign, people who never, I mean, court reporters and uh, people who wrote in the gossip columns, all having to frantically learn about landmines. They, they, I mean, they're all experts on landmines now. Most of your colleagues in the BBC know about landmines. They would never have done that. They would have never have had to learn about those things if she hadn't have been involved. And she's left the world with an, an, an incredible legacy. <laughs> She herself uh, footed on the mine and the, all the intestines got out. Intestines. Intestines, yes. I just think she found it difficult to sleep. The images were fairly stark and brutal. And, you know, you do need people to share those things with if you're to carry on. You know, you, if you give and give and give and have nobody putting anything back in, you run on empty, I think. And often after those trips, she was empty. She was very happy and very relaxed when we were in Greece together, much more so than I've seen her for some time. She wanted to unwind, she wanted to relax, and just talk about things that, that matter and things that don't matter, and just relax and unwind before coming back. It was August, and she's, she was a free woman, and she was really enjoying herself. Good for her. She deserved it.
The overwhelming sense of grief that followed the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, was borne out by the extraordinary pilgrimage to Kensington Palace, remembered by modern times on BBC Two a week on Tuesday.